Hello and good morning. It's a beautiful morning here in the city of Chicago. Huge shout out to the Puerto Rican Pride uh, Parade that's happening today. And we've got a great episode for everyone watching or listening in to on Q4Radio.org, Q4 Radio Station, 1680 AM. Also, if you want to see us, go to the Harlands Media Facebook page and uh, YouTube channel. Um, so, something wrong, guys? No, we're, right. we're good. So, so um, what what uh what I want to do is start getting this uh, story uh, started in regards to um, you know uh, first uh, Chicago is not broke. So we did a uh, live stream uh, some time ago in regards to um, Tom Tresher. Uh, he's uh, definitely gone uh, talked about it from time and time about how uh, Chicago has has resources and an income, but for some reason our city government is very corrupt. And, uh, you know, we're able to have $95 million for a police academy, uh, yet $0 for infrastructure or even, um, you know... uh, Schools. Schools, yeah, exactly. Sorry, I don't know why I froze there for a second, but... uh, (laughs) (laughs) It's all good. Chicago's not broke. It's such a shock that everyone just kind of freezes in the spot. Yeah, and so... uh, and uh, we're going to have that video uh, uploaded very soon on our YouTube page. Everyone can be able to check it out and see for yourself this 50A seminar that was taking place. And, you know, what Tom Tresher was really letting everyone know is that while the TIF funds are important, they are at the same time something that, you know, should be removed because the TIF funds are basically used by Mayor Manuel and the city council to, you know, to basically make the tourist locations and the more affluent areas of Chicago uh, beautiful. And, it's used and, to both take money from yeah. the poor and then, through other means, tax the poor of the yeah, city. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so uh, on the south side of Chicago or west side of Chicago, um, unfortunately, uh, many of their schools are shut down. Uh, there's a real clear lack of infrastructure. There's a clear uh, lack of resources for the people. And, you know, we do have a a strong economy, but it's not being used to help, uh, you know, the working class families here in the city. So, guys, I want to open the floor to you guys and uh, definitely get your thoughts on the fact that, uh, you know, Chicago is not broke. Let's hear it. Yeah, the the big figure that always stands out to me uh, when hearing Tom Tresser's work is the annual $5 billion a year that we're missing out on as a city. And they always outline it, um, that it's in three general areas. The one that Tom Tresser's really big on, the one that you've talked about, is the TIF uh, spending. That's just misappropriated uh, funds. Yeah. The other areas that he talks about is funds that we could be capturing into the city that we're not. And the big one that stood out to me was uh, the sort of Robin Hood tax that he talked about with the vast amount of uh, goods and services that are sold in the mercantile exchange every day. You could Weren't have you a tax. saying that that's about a quintillion dollars with a Q? Yeah. yeah. Quintillion. Yeah, and that's just the money and trades that flow through the mercantile exchange that, that, annually, I think, right? Yeah, and it's, and it's not taxed. So that's quintillion dollars. Mm-hmm. That's, that's bigger than a billion, everyone. It's bigger than idea, a trillion. Yeah, yeah the idea yeah. is you take a highly monopolistic commodity and put a transaction fee on large trades of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, we're talking like what, like 0.001% of – Right. Yeah. But that – you know, that's not money that the average person is having to, to spend. That's not a trade that the average person is, is doing. That's a trade that large institutions are doing, and they can fit that bill, no problem. Um, and that would be about a billion dollars annually coming in to the city. Uh, another area that they talk about, which is super obvious, is just the out-and-out loss of money through corruption uh, in the city. Um, the, another main one that they talk about is the need for progressive income tax in the state. Yeah. Uh, which a lot of people don't realize is uh, part of the Illinois state constitution that we have a flat tax, which gives it a little bit of a hurdle to overcome. Yeah, and I, I also want to mention that uh, this was also uh, – during this 58th seminar, some people were asking questions to Tom Tresher about that and how we can get a progressive income tax. And the ways we, we can go about doing it is, one, a constitutional convention. Uh, JB, uh, if J.B. Pritzker were to become governor, and this is something that he has stated that he supports, we'll – We'll see if he actually does it if he were to if he is to win the election uh, for governor here in the state, and that's a that's an if he yeah, wins. Yeah, see if he'll tax himself. Yeah, um, you know, mm-hmm. so uh, he he can implement some sort of policy to doing that. But there's there's a lot of work to get a progressive income tax. It's just we have to deal with the Illinois state constitution, so that's an issue. But it's also important to note that during the seminar, the one thing that everyone was talking about was the clear amount of corruption that is here in the city of Chicago from the very fact that you have aldermen and, you know, Cook County commissioners and even the mayor's office himself, you know, where, where they're, where they're all in collusion and, you know, they're working on just 
taking care of themselves and their donors, all the while ignoring the real issues impacting, you know, the working families here in the city. You know, we are desperately in need of having our public schools open. And the one thing that was, was being uh, addressed is that when a school is shut down, and, we, you know, when we had Fritz Craigie on here, too, and we had numerous other uh, people who are fighting against gentrification, when they all, they all said the same thing. When a school shuts down, when they close a school down, a public school, that is one of the death blows to a community because a public school is where people go to, where parents and teachers can communicate and actually implement uh, democracy. That's where democracy, uh, where people can learn how democracy works and how you can get actively involved and create better programs. But because we're shutting down our public schools, because Mayor Emanuel you know, has, has implemented that policy, uh, so many communities now are struggling to survive. Well, it's like we've said, it's a a well orchestrated strategy. The city wants to become a second Silicon Valley, wants to become more tech-oriented, wants to increase the income of the residents on average that live here. And so what is the best way to do that? You go to areas that have, uh, depending on, uh, again, if you're, if you're, if you're low income, it's, it's an affordable place that you can live and work in the city. But if you are making, you know, 50 or 100,000 plus dollars a year, it's an area that's, wow, this is incredibly cheap for the area. I would love to live here. You get people that give huge amounts of money to the mayor, to other people running that are mainly the uh, developers, the realtors and uh, construction. They come in and they go, well, I don't, you know, rehab all these different places, build new buildings up, and that in turn will increase the uh, cost of everything. But again, if you're coming in from a I have money and it's like, wow, I get to go into this wonderful place. But again, if you've lived there for decades, like with Pilsen, which has been historically the hub where if you're from Latin America and you're coming to Chicago, you you go to Pilsen until you build yourself up enough yeah. to really make it, make it worthwhile to go uh, somewhere else in the city. And if you take away like a Pilsen, you gentrify, you don't just make different people live there. You take a... A beachhead almost for people that are coming from Latin America, and you just destroy it. Which means that if you have a hypothetical someone that hasn't come about yet, who's a wonderful entrepreneur that could really change the city, something like a lot of these other big uh, people that are in Silicon Valley, they're going to be in New York. They're going to be in California instead because mm-hmm. there isn't a place for them to jump into or their parents to jump into. Because as yeah. we know, the second generation immigrant is the most likely to make a masterful impact on the U.S. Yeah. And a final note, because we do have to move on to another story. Um, 2019 is going to be a very important year for the people who live in the city of Chicago and Cook County. And I say this because that's when the municipal elections are going to take place. This will be the year, 2019 will be the year, when we can actually vote in new aldermen, new Cook County commissioners, and potentially have a new mayor. Now, we should all get actively involved and step up. I mean, now is the time to where we can demand change from our city. And if we don't step up as a people, if we don't, uh, you know, start, start like looking at our candidates and, and really holding them accountable, then we're going to still be stuck in the same situation. And look, let's say there's nobody who's challenging the, uh, you know, alderman who's been in office for 30 years. Well, then it might be you, the person who's listening to us right now. It you might better, be you. you better start working. Yeah, it might be you that needs to step up because at the end of the day, there's no one over the hill. It's going to be us who's going to have to make the better future. And, I and, we, and we can make Chicago work for everybody. We can end the hypersegregation and the corruption, but it's going to require this city and its people to step up. And I want to say I've been thinking a lot about this because I know a lot of people did not vote in the last primary, which was um, very sad because, again, part of – people are saying – and the issue that they bring up is, yeah, but – Everyone's terrible. Why would I ever go out to vote? And I think they're missing the entire point. Well, that one of the points of what makes voting powerful is that if a large group of people, doesn't matter who they are, in, in the U.S.'s case, politicians like going to old people's homes because they vote. So the point is that if a group, let's say we go back to 18 to 25-year-olds and they vote 3%, what politician would ever care about doing anything 18 to 25-year-olds want? Because they'll get maybe 3% of them to participate. The way you got to look at this is even if you have a terrible candidate, you don't have to vote for them, but vote for either a referendum referendum that's happening or maybe one judge that's going up that you think is adequate just so there's a record of an 18 to 25 year old voting because if they say, oh, wow, 10 percent, which would still be way more than what we had before, 20 percent of young people voted, we better start taking what they're saying seriously because they're now a voting block that comes out in numbers that could sway an election. Yep, and It's showing and, the power. And on top of that, and I'll just end it right here because I'll hand it over to Paul, 
uh, millennials and young people are soon going to be the largest voting bloc in U.S. history. We can make a difference, and we have to remember that these elected officials are public servants. They work for us, not the other way around. Now, Paul, I'm going to hand it to you because you've got a very important story to cover. That yeah, that dovetails Maine. with this really, really nicely. Since we're talking about voting, uh, let's talk about an interesting voting system that isn't really in use in the United States yet. It's called ranked choice voting. Not a lot of people really know uh, how it works. Uh, it's made the rounds a little bit. It was championed by the Green Party in the 2016 uh, election cycle. And the way it works is, say, hypothetically, let's, let's look at the 2016 election as an example. Say you didn't want Donald Trump, but you didn't really want Hillary either. Let's say you did want to vote for Jill Stein. In a ranked choice voting system, what you're allowed to do is rank the candidates in order that you would like them. You could say, I want Jill Stein as my number one, Hillary as my number two, Gary Johnson as my number three, and then finally Trump as number four. And it's, it, another name for it is instant runoff, right? So let's say Jill Stein didn't get enough votes for she, plurality. She gets 5% just to have a number. Yeah. Let's say she gets just 5%. Um, my votes would then be switched over to the next candidate if she was out of the race. So that way I can vote for the candidate I really want for without risking sort of the letting the person I really don't want to win getting into office. It completely eliminates the spoiler effect. Right. Yeah. It, it's a, it eliminates the spoiler effect and it, it mitigates this sort of first past the post mentality, this like this binary duality system. The reason I bring up ranked choice voting is that on Tuesday, citizens of Maine were able to pass a people's veto that were allowed to keep ranked choice voting on the board, uh, on the, the ballot for future elections. So here's what happened is in November 2016, there was a referendum uh, to approve ranked choice voting in the state of Maine, um, but it got mired in legal challenges for over a year. Um, and then... Uh, a Republican-led legislature basically overturned the the citizens' you know choice to have ranked choice voting, and the citizens were able to gather enough signatures to get it put on a ballot that they were able to vote on on Tuesday and affirm, basically institute a people's veto and say, no, we voted for this, and we were serious, we really want it. So in Maine, they have ranked choice voting, They're the first state in the country to have it. What do you guys think? And then you have a great example. I believe it was in San Francisco, which is the city that has ranked choice voting, mm -hmm. which previously, just to give an idea of how this works out, there were, if I remember correctly, there was a, an establishment candidate and there were two progressive candidates. And it completely changes the way that uh, campaigns organize because right now when it's this kind of voting system where it's either or, it's you destroy your opponent until there's nothing left of them hoping that you survive the fallout. Whereas in San Francisco, you had the two candidates that said, hey, if you like me, vote for me, but vote for this guy second. And the other guy would be like, oh, if you like me, vote for me, but vote for her second. So when they actually the voting came down to happening, the establishment Democrat actually had the more votes in the first round. But because of how they, the system then goes, OK, well, who got the least votes? You take them out. You take their votes. You pass them on to whoever they got. In the second round, I believe – the uh, whoever got this, whoever got second or third place, gave all their votes to the other progressive because the they progressive were working. Candidates were able to sort of team up and, and so, coalesce around yeah. their own. And platforms. so that way, they didn't have to fight over which one. They actually were great allies. They were at a lot of campaign events together, and so the progressive ended up winning, even though in the first round individually they had less votes. Which I think is a much more cooperative strategy than this just destructive. I'm going to do opposition because if you in a ranked choice system, you don't want to do that because you might turn off voters that might vote for you second. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, that's how a healthy democracy works. And plus, uh, then we can actually open the real conversation of having not only a third party, but four parties, uh, five parties, like really discussing a uh, parliamentary system. Yeah, even. A, a, a true parliamentary system, because, you know, we, we we've interviewed in the past people from the Green Party, Libertarian Party and from political organizations like Socialist Alternative and Democratic Socialists of America. Can you imagine if, if you know, there was uh, the ability of having those four po podiums right next to the Republicans and Democrats? Because then the Republicans and Democrats can't go say, I'm not this person. No, I'm not this person. Vote blue or red, whatever you choose. No, then we could start talking about policies and issues because that's what Americans want to hear. They want to talk about stuff that's going to impact them. And right now, 40 percent of Americans identify themselves as independents. That number is going to get bigger because people are, tar are, are tired of the two-party neoliberal corporate establishment system. The same corporations, lobbyists, banks, and Wall Streets that donate to Republicans also donate to the Democrats. And remember, the Democrats and Republicans in Washington, D.C., 
do whatever they can to protect their donor class. Yeah, they, you, the Democrats might be correct on some social issues, but they're lackluster and they only give half measures. Can you imagine if we had like a, a, you know, a real true debate and have a real open parliamentary system? Then we can start talking about the issues impacting Americans. Yeah, I want to be clear. Ranked choice voting being passed in Maine is awesome, and that's a huge step in the right direction toward yeah. including other parties and things like that, but it is by, by no means a fixed system, right. right? New Hampshire is the only state in the country that does paper ballots um, and has a citizen accountable recounts. Uh, mm -hmm. There are other major uh, election issues that we need to, to worry about. We still have an electoral college. We still have superdelegates in, in the, the DNC. Yeah. Um, th this is by no means ironed out. And the ballot access is issues are still a problem for third parties. And then you have Ohio, what just happened in Ohio, where the Supreme Court says, yeah, you can purge voters. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Th there, that's there are okay. so many <laughs> issues with the way we run elections in this country, but this is just sort of a, a ray of sunshine through the clouds having uh, Maine pass this uh, yeah. citizen's veto. It's just really power of democracy. It's just a good story. And one thing I want to add is that for people, again, that we've said that, well, the, the people that are like, oh, the system's rigged, there's nothing I can do, again, that's not true. It's it's a it's an elbow on the scale. There's a huge difference. Rigged means that we don't live in a democracy at all, and really anything you do politically is irrelevant, which is not the case at all. What it means is that, as, at least in Chicago, I've surmised that it means that to be a non-incumbent to win an election against an incumbent requires you to get 60 percent of the vote to get 51 percent of the vote. So it's harder. Yeah. Well, what do you expect? There's a power structure that's corrupt and wants to remain in power so it can keep feeding itself, and there are things they're trying to stop it. It's going to be more difficult. That just means you've got to fight harder, not give up. Yeah, and, you know, in Illinois, we have the strictest draconian law stopping, you know, independents or third parties from being on the ballot and being on the debate stage. Uh, you know, as we said before, uh, if you're running as a green or libertarian or you know w or, or independent, you need to get a 25,000 signatures plus an additional mm -hmm. 25,000 signatures in so about half 50, the time. Yeah, uh, and so that's altogether 50,000 signatures just to make sure you're secure enough to be on the ballot and potentially be on the debate stage. And uh, as Democrats and Republicans, they only need about what 2,000 to 5,000 signatures. Yeah, generally, it's like if you're a Democrat or Republican, you got to get 2,500, but then you always have to double it because, like we've talked about in every election, someone's going to challenge you, so you always have to have twice as many signatures yeah. as you need. But then again, but you get to if you're a Democrat or Republican, you get like an extra six months to do that. And yeah. so when like libertarians or Greens, when they're running candidates, are going to start collecting signatures, they're already fundraising. Yeah. So they have to then collect signatures and fundraise, which is its own issue that we've talked about on previous shows. Yeah. Right. And, you know, Illinois, I, I, I would like to see us have that kind of same system in Maine so we can actually have true debates and end the two party establishment system because people are tired of Democrats and Republicans. They're, are, and again, this is to everyone out there. If we want to implement change, it's going to require us to step up. But, uh, now we're going to cover on another story, which is uh, international and has to deal with the trade war that Trump just seems to be intensifying as the days go by. And right now, Trump— China's it, back on the map for trade war. Yeah. Uh, you know, first we're having a trade war with Canada. The Europe, well, well, first we had a trade war with China, but then Trump recanted on that. Then now after the failure of the G7 summit, we have a trade war with Canada and the European Union. And apparently now the trade war is back on with China all over again. So that, Trump, that, half a, that half a billion dollars they threw into that Indonesian hotel was not enough. Yeah, so mm -hmm. Trump puts 25% tariff on Chinese goods, and as last I heard, China did respond back yeah. in regards to putting tariffs on Everyone's us. Everyone's tariffing us now. Yeah, and you know, we don't have the same infrastructure that we had in the 1950s where we produced our own stuff. Like A lot of the goods that we get are from overseas, from China, a lot of our products we get is from a China. Yeah. So I, if it, it, when, when some I look of our at, military equipment is made in China, yeah. So so really? when so a little so, bit. So, so the very fact that we have, um, you know, our president uh, pushing forward for this uh, trade war really should uh, make a lot of us scared because it could lead to a huge economic disaster. One of which that can make the the recession in two thousand eight seem like a joke. Um, I, for one, am concerned about this because uh, how can we recover from this trade war when we're angering all our our allies, but also uh, potential uh, trade partners in the east, such as uh, China? You know, China is is a serious economic powerhouse. In fact, they're the second economic powerhouse in the international community. Uh, Paul, yeah, and this comes sort of on the heels of a lot of 
geopolitical diplomacy that's gone back and forth in a number of arenas. We've pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement, pulled out of the Iran deal. We've got first round of, you know, tariffs against China with soybeans, then a round of tariffs against our own allies, and then Russia should be in the G7, and let's go talk to North Korea, and, like, what's going on? There's just this giant, giant swings of, like, what is the... What is the overall general direction of the foreign policy of this administration? Because it seems like it just swings like a pendulum every day. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It for him, it doesn't stop. And my concern is that you only could be lucky for so long until one day you trip and fall, and it's a complete disaster. So what I think is interesting about this is like like you said, it's we used to make stuff here, and so. You know, when we were maybe like in the 1800s, this would have not been that big of an issue because everything would have been made within, you know, 25 or 50 miles from you. But, you know, most of the stuff that exists around wherever you are is probably made in China. And a lot of other stuff is made in uh, our allied countries. I mean, it's we're talking a huge percentage of GDP of the U.S. is tied to this form of activity. I mean, you can argue that it's, you know, it shouldn't be done this way. It's too corporate friendly it's to whatever but it's still a system that exists and you can change a system but you, it's terrible to just knock it over especially when the u.s the the hegemony of the u.s the empire that the u.s pushes on the rest of the world requires the cooperation of the countries that they're pushing it requires the eu to purchase military equipment from us because then we get the money from that if they decide they want to make their own well we're out of uh, many 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 billions of dollars and uh, you're talking like uh, we export a lot of stuff as well. So uh, some of the biggest export uh, – most of the states, I think a majority of the states, actually their biggest exporting neighbor is Canada. Mm-hmm. And so they're not going to get it from us. But like it's not like we are the only ones that make things. It's just easier for Canada because we have an alliance and we're friends and we're happy to trade with each other. And we have a shared border, so that's mm-hmm. even easier. But you know, like just like with China, they have been buying – soybeans from the u.s but then they're like yeah but russia makes soybeans too and they need to uh, sell them so the everything that's happening the u.s acts like if we pull back that no one will have an option but there's a world of options a world of options quite literally that all these other countries can go with so the only people so the u.s effectively is saying i'm gonna do a trade war on everyone which means everyone's gonna declare war on the u.s whereas the u.s is already precarious as is we already have an economy that's built on stilts built on a house of cards built on a set of other stilts and it's about to flood anyway so we're just setting ourselves up for either uh the recession that's or the the real depression that's going to happen eventually or we're going to hurt our alliances or we're going to like i said before, we're just not going to be the most powerful nation, or we would probably be the third most powerful nation. The way I see um, how this administration is, is acting, and especially representing the United States, we're acting like that person in the bar that thinks they're tough, that thinks they're strong, and eventually everyone gets tired of that person's crap, and they wait for him outside, and they beat the crap out of him. <laughs> All right? And, and the thing is, is like, we are, we, with this administration, we are destroying alliances that have been around for 50 plus years. And we're already antagonizing China, and I'm pretty sure sooner or later we're going to antagonize Russia. If we haven't done it already, it's going to happen pretty soon, especially with somebody like Donald Trump uh, as with the seat of power. And with the economic system that we have, the very fact that he's knocking it over, the one thing that's going on in the back of my mind is we don't have a backup system. So should there be a huge economic collapse, especially here in the United States, how many people are going to really trust our currency? How many people are going to really value the name of the United States as a true economic powerhouse? Uh, if there is to be a huge depression, it's going to be caused by us. And how, how many of the members of the international community really want to trust the United States being the leading world power again, especially if we cause an economic disaster that will affect countless millions of people? I just figured out Trump's strategy. He knows the U.S. is going to crash. He's being considerate, and he's distancing our economies from everyone around us. So when we collapse, they're fine. It's very considerate of him. He, uh. He's doing it to save the world economy. And that's mm-hmm. what's up. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I always think of this. When you, when you talk about the world economy, um, the U.S. dollar is sort of propped up on the sale of oil. Uh, mm-hmm. That's, that's the, the backbone of it. So I think about a lot of the the, the principles that we hold really dear, like, Saving the planet, going to renewable energies, um, not having you know U.S. hegemony in the, the Middle East and wars that that go on there, and not having you know trade wars like this. If a lot of those things came to pass, particularly you know massive renewable energies, um, 
the U.S. dollar would suffer as a result because it's backed by oil interests. And if that oil interest is no longer as powerful as it was before, the U.S. dollar is no longer as powerful as it was before. And we know, I mean, just <clears throat> just a few months ago, the U.S. was getting real um, heated at China and Russia for dealing in uh, the yuan, trading oil in the yuan. Like, and that's a huge deal because it, it's, it's an affront to the U.S., you know, petrodollar hegemony. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of spitballing here, but how does how does this, you know, bolstering kind of like throw taxes at all of our allies and enemies all the time and just try to make economic chaos fit into that? Well, then I mean, that goes back to what well, you're talking about with the Iran deal, that already the EU is like, hey, we'll start trading in not – Petrodollars right. will be trading in um, – what's the Iranian currency? Do you have oh, I don't know. If that well, they'll be trading in that currency instead. Again, what, what Paul's saying, which is incredibly important to remember, is that whenever you buy oil from Saudi Arabia, you have to do it in U.S. dollars. Mm-hmm. It's a deal that we've made, which means that it makes the U.S. dollar incredibly valuable throughout the world because it's the thing that allows you to buy the energy that powers your country. So as a, just an example with Saudi Arabia, they're investing in – Huge amounts of solar energy because they're you know they're in a, they're in a desert it's very hot so they're but because they have so much oil money they're able to hey, say Daniel hindsight twenty twenty hey we got this sun it's there twenty four seven let's build solar panels as, as I say <laughs> why would you ever dig into the ground to find hundreds of millions of year old bacteria fossils when that were at some point used to capture energy from the sun three hundred million yeah, years ago stored sun energy yeah when you can just get it directly why yeah. why 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 dig it up and convert it because then you're just pulling in carbon that was originally going to eventually going to go under the earth's crust and into the mantle yeah. and so what we have now is a system where china's putting every hour they're building a football field of solar panels which is amazing to, just that in, in the industry of doing that you and they're gonna if it goes down that path china will lead because it's, you know it, it, the u.s one reason the u.s led with oil was we were the first ones that did it, and we exported all the technology that we used. And so everyone relied on the U.S. too for you know, the innovation side of it or the maintenance side of it or what have you. That's still true today, that if you're a, 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 a country that has oil, you just get Exxon to come in and they'll do the work for you and they'll pay you for it. Yeah. And so that's really easy on your end. Whereas solar is – going to be that next thing or, or just renewables in general and you know you have germany working on a fusion reactor you have china working on a fusion reactor you have again china mass producing so many solar panels that if the u.s doesn't fix things we're just going to mix miss the next trends and yeah. instead of us being the ones leading and being the manufacturers of the future we're going to be buying it from china and then we're going to feel like how most of the world has felt like towards the u.s yeah so it's, the it's, bottom line is Trump's going to get a property deal in Shanghai out of this. Yeah, no, it's going to be really nice. Yeah, it's, it's going to be it's going to be huge. Trump in big letters. It's it's, it's going to be huge and magnificent, at least according to Trump. But uh, that being said, we are going to cover uh, a very important segment here. We've talked about in the past, and we have a representative from the Chicago uh, Borica Resistance here. Uh, I want everyone to remember. Um, in the past, Heartland's media has talked about uh, the island of Puerto Rico, and especially the unfortunate disaster that happened with the hurricane last summer um you know it led to thousands of deaths uh and also a lack of clear uh, infrastructure uh on the island and so the chicago barrico resistance actually went there uh, we had a representative on our show much earlier on last year but now um you know during that time they were actually in puerto rico helping out with relief efforts as well as communicating with groups that were there helping lead to the reconstruction and so that being said, for our viewers and listeners, can you please introduce yourself t- uh, to our audience? Yes, my name is Veronica. Thank you for having me here today, with you guys. Mm-hmm. So I, I think, uh, uh, real quick, could we get like a general understanding of what your organization is about, and then we can get into the details about uh, what you guys uh, did on the island and you know just what you did in regards to participating in relief efforts? Yes, Chicago Break Resistance is a group of people fighting against colonialism in Puerto Rico, basically people from the island mm-hmm. that just came to Chicago, people that's been living here for the whole for their whole lives. And we're just united against colonialism in Puerto Rico and, and against the austerity measures that were imposed since 2016 uh, uh, when uh, Obama signed the law PROMESA, the PROMESA law. Right. Uh, so we all know about the devastating hurricane that hit the island. And in the aftermath... 
corporate media or at least the Trump administration was stating to the media that, oh, there was about 18 deaths, 64 deaths. The hurricane wasn't all that bad. The devastation to the island wasn't bad at all. But when, in fact, uh, for countless months, almost for a whole year, the island of Puerto Rico was without power, clean water. Uh, the hospitals were, were non-functioning. And the death count wasn't 64 or 18. It was actually uh, uh, we, we we covered it on a much earlier episode. It's closer it, to 5,000, 800, 5,000 to 8,000 people. So, uh, in regards to that, we know that you guys were on the ground firsthand. So, can you uh, give our viewing audience just a general understanding of what what was going on there, and were you guys uh, communicating with the Harvard Study Research Group that was uh, covering this unfortunate loss of human life? Yes. Well, last month, uh, Harvard University, the School of Public Health, published results based on, it was a community survey. Mm -hmm. So they went to different communities uh, up, uh, from the 78 municipalities in Puerto Rico to ask people about people who know the, uh, that uh, died after mm -hmm. the hurricane. It was a community survey. So that data says that the, the actual death toll could be between eight hundred to eight thousand mm -hmm. and from that report came this controversial number of uh, four thousand and six hundred forty five deaths so after that name uh, number came uh, to public the Puerto Rican people uh, protested and did a demonstration like a memorial in front of the capital of Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and because of all that pressure the government uh, I think it was like a week ago they gave CNN the the demographic data, mm -hmm. the demo demographic office data uh, that estimates that, that that says that twelve thousand people died after the hurricane, not just because of the hurricane. So, the difficult uh, the the difficult part of, about getting the the actual number is because there's no like um, how do we say there's not a like an actual standardized way. To mm -hmm. know how yeah. many people died when after. someone dies of a stroke, is it because they got a stroke or because of aggregated effects of the hurricane? That or, led them or, to or, or could they not get their own medicine? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. of the fact mm -hmm. that that hurricane basically destroyed the entire infrastructure. And I mm -hmm. want everyone to understand that when that hurricane hit, the entire of island Puerto Rico basically regressed back to medieval ages. And it's unfortunate to say that because you know there was no clean water, no power. Absolutely no response efforts. And yeah, like, like I was saying before, imagine if a Florida retirement community somehow couldn't be evacuated and then lost its air conditioning. Yeah. People would die. People and would we die. would say, well, well, did they die because they were going to die or was it aggravated because of the air conditioning? Now, you have other statistical data in regards to uh, the unfortunate loss of human life on the island of Puerto Rico when, when the hurricane after the hurricane hit. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, after the after the hurricane, the government uh, ordered the cremation of nine nine hundred and eleven bodies, mm -hmm. uh, whose deaths were not properly identified. So there's people that have family who died after the hurricane and weren't able to actually see the bodies, okay. and that happened. And uh, the the four thousand six hundred forty five uh, death toll is not counting that number. Okay, and. You know, we, we, on Harlan's Media, we've covered gentrification here in the city of Chicago, uh, especially in a lot of low-income communities. But the one thing that we've heard, uh, especially from you know your group in regards to the reconstruction effort, was that it's basically one-sided and that there's a large form of gentrification that's happening on the island. So uh, first question, what is the recon what exactly is going on with the reconstruction effort in Puerto Rico? Is there still power in the communities? I mean, has there ever been any kind of follow-through with providing energy and clean water to the working-class families in Puerto Rico? Well, in the tourist areas, of course. It's power since maybe a month after or weeks after the hurricane. But there's communities, rural community communities that still live in with, without energy, people that lacks energy for their health resources, for their machines to, to get air. <laughs> so we went uh, in the spring break, that was March 24 to April the 1st, to Puerto Rico, and we worked with two different community, uh, community centers called the Mutual Aid Centers. Mm -hmm. And Miguel, who was here uh, last year with you guys, he talked about the Mutual Aid Centers and uh, their work to rebuild the areas and their community they're living in. Uh, Umacao is in the southeast part of Puerto Rico, and Caguas is still metropolitan area, but it's kind of the center near San Juan. Okay. So we sent a group of 20 students, teachers from the CTU and UIC, mm -hmm. College of Education, and a group of community members, activists that wanted to help. And they were working with uh, everyday, everyday work. 
in the in the kitchens, uh, building community gardens to sustain planting and food uh, food security for the communities. And the CBR uh, representative who was Miguel the last show, he talked about it a little bit, but then I'm glad to be here today mm-hmm. uh, because we are going to do a report back July the 8th. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, uh, joined uh, an Abayan Chical, which is a Philippine group who also did a, a, a brigades to Philippines, mm-hmm. and we want to we want to make aware of this together in, uh, as an international issue. So we're going to talk about their experiences in Puerto Rico uh, and what the work they did with the community centers in that day too. And just a note that uh, when that's happening, give us uh, an email. We'd love to see if we can attend that. Yeah, we, we would like to definitely attend that and uh, talk more about it because the one thing uh, people seem to forget that Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory and the people of Puerto Rico are American citizens. And the very fact that this administration – Who can't vote. Yeah, yeah. The, the very fact that this administration is turning a blind eye to the American citizens, uh, it, it should make every one of us upset. These are human lives. They haven't done anything wrong. Paul? Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, you mentioned some of the austerity measures that were put in on Puerto Rico in 2016. How has that um, sort of exacerbated or made worse the situation uh, since the hurricane? Well, people leaving the island, first of all, uh, getting empty. And then after the hurricane, different uh, austerity measures like privatization of schools, of the health system, uh, and the electricity system, that was in there. But after the hurricane, of course, uh, disaster capitalism, they took the advantage of it. And, okay, we have a system that doesn't work, an energy system that doesn't work. What, what happened after the hurricane? They give a contract to Whitefish Energy, a company with just two employees, two employees to restore the whole system of Puerto Rico. And uh, media discovered it, media published it, reported it, and then they took they canceled the contract. Mm-hmm. They also contract another agency that has, I don't know how many employees, but they're not doing their work because there's people without electricity still, and they're planning to uh, p- privatize it. So another austerity measure is they, jo- they already closed 300 schools in the last couple months. Yeah, and we, 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 wow. we already know uh, firsthand here, especially in the city of Chicago under Mayor Emanuel's administration, 50 schools have been shut down, and when you shut down a school, it's a death blow to a community. You uh, basically systematically rip the heart out. So I have a question. So I know that, like, have there have there been any, like, good companies, companies that have been doing a decent job fixing either the water or the infrastructure or the electric that Puerto Ricans can at least say, well, at least they're getting it right? I'll say not companies but community members and people organizing in their own communities. Mm -hmm. Uh, This mutual aid center or mutual aid project in Umacao, Mariana, uh, they already have solar panels established. Mm -hmm. They have the community kitchen, the sustainable community kitchen. They've been providing food since the hurricane, and they haven't ended that. Mm -hmm. They still have that program because they want to build sustainable sustainable community. And they are – they also – how do you like? How do you say where you storage the water? So um, water tank. Yeah, um, yeah. They so. ha- they had that too after the hurricane. So they're building a community that doesn't depend that much on the government. But mm-hmm. I wouldn't say it's companies. It's the whole their own people doing it. So so even though um, after the hurricane hit, there's still areas, large portions of the island that have zero power and zero clean water. Is that correct? Yes. That's devastating to hear about. So, go go ahead, Daniel. No, yeah. I was going to say it's something that we would never stand for in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, especially here in the mainland. I uh, mean, but, but to be to be to be a little tragic at the same time, unless it was you know very very poor areas, which we wouldn't care about. Generally. Yeah, this so is so how we've treated Puerto Rico for decades, right? Yeah, there's there's sort of a, a debt country. haven that you know rich individuals and corporations are able to use to basically manipulate their own you know flow of income. We prevent Puerto Rico from importing goods from other countries that has to come th- from U.S. mainland ports, which is a huge crippling effect on the island. You mentioned the whitefish and the austerity measures and the, the way that disaster capitalism, I love that you mentioned that, um, that that is being used in the wake of, of Maria to sort of continue to gut this population that is that doesn't deserve this kind of treatment. No. It hasn't. No, they're American citizens, and, you know, it's, it's it should be everyone here in this, on the mainland should be foaming at the mouth, angry that this is what we're doing 
to our own countrymen. You know, if, 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 if there was a dictatorship doing this to, a, to its own people or to another country, I can guarantee you this corporate media would be saying, we got to stop them right Unless now. Unless they we, have oil and we uh, have a positive relationship with <laughs> yeah, them. Exactly, exactly. The thing is that we didn't even ask to be American citizens. Exactly. Like yeah, the yeah. U.S. colonized, the uh, Spani- uh, Spain colonizes then oh, take U.S., I don't want them no more, and oh, you suddenly are American citizens. Like, we didn't even wanted that. <laughs> right. Yeah, we never consulted the people of Puerto Rico. You're or just, like, blame <laughs> the man on Spain. Yes. Uh, yeah. So well, one thing I want to ask, though, in regards to the gentrification that's happening in Puerto Rico, you mentioned how there was a quick reconstruction effort in the tourist locations and in the rich communities, I, I assume, as well. Yeah. Uh, so one, why, not exactly why, but uh, what is the impact of the gentrification and who is really, uh, like, What's what's the government the, the, in Puerto Rico doing to really and who's benefiting uh, yeah, from yeah, all yeah. this? Who's, yeah, who's benef- benefiting from this? What's the government trying to do to stop it? Is there anyone trying to stop the gentrification? Uh, what, what's actually happening with that? Uh, I don't think there's a, an actual campaign to stop it. They mm-hmm. just, the government and other corporations haven't done anything to stop that. Uh, but it is estimated that maybe from. 200,000 people from 300,000 people since since from September to December moved to the U.S., mostly to uh, to Florida, mm-hmm. New York. Uh, we received like 3,000 here in Chicago. I mean, I w- the only possible thing I can say that it's like a, like the, the res- is at least Florida will have a better chance of going Democrat in the next. I mean, that's the o- I'm trying to think of any. There's really no positive. No, there, there is people that are just being taken over. Everything that they, they you know, built up, and we've seen this all throughout the country, throughout the city. Everything's washed away as soon as a disaster happens. People with money come in, and they're able to capture all of that. And then people with nothing are left with even less, and people with a lot are even richer. Yeah. Well, and the, the thing about whitefish, and this is that disaster capitalism coming in and taking profits. Right. This is a, you know there's a need here. So you get a shell company that says, we'll take the bid. Let my buddies in government give me the contract where all I'm really doing is subcontracting out to someone else who actually does this work, because I don't know how it works. And I'm going to subcontract it out for more expensive than it would actually be. And because I'm playing middle middleman, I just am taking money from the government. Yeah. yeah. So. And I'm glad you talked uh, in the previous section about how is the power, the, the power shapes the economy. Because we do have solar energy. We live in a Caribbean island. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. we have... So you got this, the sun. Hindsight 2020. 93 <laughs> degrees are, is everyday life mm-hmm. there. So how is it that the government is also talking about imposing ta- taxes to the communities and the people and families who, who put uh, solar panels in oh, their Oh, they're houses? doing that? Oh. Yep. Oh, no. And, and, they oh, okay. suck. Hey, <laughs> hey, you're getting your own power. Well, we're going to get some money off that because we're not making enough right. money off you, you right now. You can't do this. Okay, so <laughs> can you collect rainwater? Is that illegal too? Is that that's illegal in Florida? You can. No, you, you can do that. Okay, okay, well at least you're not Florida. Okay, well you know what? Probably chances are. I'm cor- glad we're not Florida. Well, when yeah. they see when they see you're doing enough, it, then they'll probably make you like Florida. Like yeah, that. and then because of course you know U.S. capitalism, of course corporations always want to have maximize their profits all while uh, hurting uh, working class people. So uh, what I want to know is, and I think a lot of our viewing audience wants to know, uh, what is your is your organization still on the ground in Puerto Rico? And um, also, are you guys also reaching out to any climate scientists? Because, you know, before we talk, uh, before we uh, got on the air, we were both talking about uh, climate change and hurricane season. Apparently, you uh, in the Caribbean right now, it's hurricane season. So, uh, one, what is your group? Is your group still in Puerto Rico? And two, uh, is there been any kind of outreach to any kind of climate scientists in regards I, I to preparing for say, these hurricanes? What happens if another hurricane hits? Yeah. Okay, for, first, uh, Chicago Recovery System is not longer in Puerto Rico, okay. but we're planning di- different brigades. Uh, one of them is going to be uh, in collaboration with Asara's daughter. Mm-hmm. We're trying to, to get them next year to keep rebuilding and organizing because we think that soli- uh, international solidarity is the only thing that will help us put the, the message out there. So we're working with uh, Anna Bayan Chicago, with No Cop Academy, with uh, Asara's daughter to just to bring together the issues that affect us all. So that's what we're doing. And your question, I... Uh, with the, well, with the climate scientists, has there been any kind of outreach towards uh, the climate community? Uh, no. To be honest, the group hasn't reached out to any climate scientists, but I'll take that as a suggestion. Okay. And then <laughs> uh, to, to Daniel's question, of course, you know, we, you mentioned to me before we got on the show that, we are, that in the Caribbean, uh, it is hurricane season, and 
uh, from the recent data that scientists were collecting from last year that they're theorizing that there gonna be, there's going to be more yeah, because, super hurricanes. So, what's, the, what's, so yeah. what's going to happen? If, is, is there talk about another potential super hurricane hitting the island again? And if so, what's going to happen? Oh, I have no idea what is going to happen, but it's for, for sure it's going to be worse it's, uh, if a hurricane hits because the government has said it uh, openly we're not prepared. Okay. Uh, the governor says we are. But if you go municipality to municipality, mm -hmm. mayor says, like, no, we are. We have no plan. Well, we still have no power in some places, so we still have uh, the blue FEMA uh, roofs. Mm -hmm. So how is that we're going to survive a hurricane with that? Yeah, it's hard to survive a hurricane with a tent. Um, do you think that the areas that got built up, the tourist areas, do you think they have a plan set up? Oh, definitely. <laughs> okay. Well, of course, because there's countless millions. I, I mean, you, hey, you got to protect there. the investment. Yeah. That's the important thing. Citizens, so what? Just the investment that matters. Wow, that's yeah. it's, it's it's really devastating to um, hear that. I mean, for one thing, uh, I want to say uh, thank you to your group. That's you know actually going back to Puerto Rico. You're really, doing more than the yeah. U.S. government is. Yeah, which more, is really more than the U.S. government terrible, is. And, and but, the thing is, uh, uh, you're informing the people here about what's happening there, and we have a social responsibility to really help out people because there's going to be a day when, especially in the mainland, when we might be struggling. And would anyone want to help us out after how we've been treating countless people for thousands of years? I mean, not thousands of years, you know, countless years. For years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you know. Centuries, so, so, yeah. yeah. Hum but, well, humans in general. Yeah, has been, it, it is a cycle, sadly, that yeah. human civilization has participated in forever. Yeah, and I want to apologize for a thousand years. I don't know why that came in the back of my mind. <laughs> what? You know. A thousand years. Ancestors yeah. are yeah. talking. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, but, it, but, it's, but, it's, but it's a devastating aspect to, to hear that this is still happening in the island of Puerto Rico. So uh, for our viewers and listeners, I'm pretty sure there's somebody out there who wants to help or volunteer or donate or learn more about your group. Where can they find you guys on social media? Where can they learn more about you? Uh, do you guys have a website? Yes, we do have a fa Facebook page and we are very responsive. If you message us there, mm -hmm. it's Decolonize PR. Mm -hmm. uh, in Facebook, the colonized PR or Chicago Rico Resistance, if you just search it, mm -hmm. and the email is Chicago Rico Resistance at Gmail. Okay. Can you spell that out? Oh my God! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, because we, we we do have to make sure that at least people if know so, where to go. If someone's going to type, it, we want to make sure they get. And then, of course, they can always look at uh, decolonized PR. Whenever I look up you guys on Facebook, it's always easier for me for decolonized PR. Yes. Yeah, you can look for to decolonized PR, and we can give you all the information there. Is C H I C A G O B O R I C U A R E S I S T A N C E. Well, we spelled it out for you guys. You should get that down now. All right, make sure you help these guys but out. If right. you message us on Facebook, we're going to be very responsive, and you can just contact us there. All right, Veronica, thank you so much Thanks for being on Hard Lens Media. Uh, we are going to be entering into our break uh, right now, so we'll be entering into the second hour. So uh, if you're listening to Hard Lens Media, you can listen to us on Q4Radio.org, uh, Q4 Radio Station, 1680 AM, or you can listen to us or you can see us on our Facebook live stream or our YouTube channel. Uh, Hard Lens Media is an independent media outlet. You can learn more about us on hardlensmedia.com, H-A-R-D-L-E-N-S-M-E-D-I-A.com. And if you like what we do, if you like the content I'm that we have... I'm going to jump yeah. in on that. I'm going to say to everyone, guys, what we what we try and do is we try and bring stories throughout the city, mm -hmm. throughout the country to you, so you can hear what's happening in a lens that for people that are covering it, we don't want to spin what they do. We want to hear what they have to say directly. And for stories, we want to give you a take that you won't hear really anywhere else yeah. in, on any almost any other media. So if you guys really like what we do and you say, well, I really like listening to Hard Lens Media, you guys inform me in a way that... I'm not usually informed when I hear about people that I'd never heard of. What we would love from you, if you really if you have a dollar to spare, just a dollar a month, that's $12 a year, head up to our Patreon page. You can see it through hardlensmedia.com or you can just go to patreon.com slash hardlensmedia. Yeah. We're trying to build up as much as we can so we can continue to not just bring you more stuff like this, but to bring you better in-depth coverage, more research, eventually get a team of writers. We really want to develop what we have here into something that not just reaches what you're hearing now, but something beyond that, something that has the power to not only bring people on and give them a spotlight, but to actually make a difference in lives of people. Yeah, and I also want to add on there, too, look, that $1 is the main heart and backbone to Hard Lens Media. Uh, without it, you know, we, we can barely, you know, it, it, it means a lot. And on top of that, too, uh, there's a lack of independent media here in this city, and we 
want to have a strong independent media outlet here in the city of Chicago, and we are asking this entire community, let's all step up and get involved and cover the news that corporate establishment media will not cover. That being said, uh, please uh, stay tuned. Uh, We're just going to enter our second break, and we'll see you guys in the second hour. Peace, everyone. And we are back. Welcome to the second hour of Hard Lens Media. That was a great uh, first hour that we did. Uh, Of course, we're covering a lot of hot topic issues and important uh, current events. And with that being said, we are going to bring it right back here to the city of Chicago. And there is a lot of controversy, a lot of uh, buzz uh, about Elon Musk and his uh, potential of building a you know hyperloop from O'Hare Airport to downtown city of Chicago. Um, me and Daniel are huge fans of Elon Musk, just especially to dis- just to disclose yeah. our bias. Yeah, because you know and. And the thing is, uh, there's a lot of people that are for it, and there's a lot of people against it. Everyone's bringing up uh, their concerns, as well as the potential, uh, you know, uh, you know, benefits that we can get from a hyperloop. So, with that being said, uh, Daniel, I'm going to uh, hand this over to you because uh, you know you definitely introduced me to Elon Musk, and uh, I think it's really important that we cover this story because it can impact uh, this entire city. So just to give an overview of what's happened, Elon has uh, has been working on the Boring Company for a long period of time. I've been following his the developments with that. He's ideas that, just like with rocket technology and with car technology, he wants to take something that is impossible and do it for 10 times less than it would be done conventionally. So with rockets, it used to be and still is if you're going for like a Boeing rocket or whatever – or a Delta rocket, it's like you know four hundred million dollars to launch it plus the satellite cost. Whereas a SpaceX rocket, the current ones are like eighty million dollars to mm-hmm. launch. So that's he's he's a, he's a guy that does the impossible really well. I'm a, you know I want us I have very uh, I want us to get off the planet, so I'm all for him doing that. So with that being said, you have the Boring Company. The idea of the Boring Company is hey, can we do tunnels that we can move things around in, whether it be public transit or the electric cars that he's building, for and do that, building the tunnel faster for, again, a uh, magnitude less of cost or several magnitudes less in cost. Uh, with the developments that he had, because I've seen a couple of presentations with him talking about how to do that, it's most tunnels have to be like 24 feet wide. He's shrinking it down to a quarter that size, which just drastic. I think it cuts it like the price by a magnitude or two. All this is what he's been saying about it. Just figuring out ways for the tunneler to go faster, to not break down as much, deal, you know, fix all the issues that have been normally dealt with previous ventures. And that's kind of what he does in all his businesses. So in this case, he has the he's almost done constructing a test tunnel in L.A. and Chicago uh, has uh, brought him on because they wanted to find a way to get people to go from O'Hare to uh, the downtown area of the city, and it seems like they've been working on that for a while, Emmanuel. I saw that press conference where he was saying that they've been, they're going to be updating the L lines, they're going to be updating O'Hare. They seem like they're really trying to make O'Hare a much more important part, which goes to what we were saying in the first hour, that they're trying to make Chicago a city for richer people, and it it fits in with that. It's it's very much the case that any, whoever was going to build this, whatever transportation it would have been, it would have worked out the same way that it would have been for the about 20,000 people to go from O'Hare to the city. Now, it's quite clear that this Hyperloop, it can get uh, people back and forth uh, from O'Hare, like, what, 12 minutes to get there? 12, 12 or 13 minutes. minutes. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, one... It's so th- fast. Yeah, that, that is really fast. And look, I think we've all either taken the CTA or taken a car or an Uber or, or a taxi. To park in the airport. You know, it's a, to O'Hare, it's a nightmare. It's, it's a complete disaster. Our, and look, our rail system is heavily outdated. Yeah. And, Which is good that they're, again, yeah. they're trying to fix a few of the lines at least. Yeah. Maybe. And, and, we'll and, see. And, and, that, and that is true. Like, you know, hopefully we can get, you know, a better transportation system via with car, Hyperloop, CTA. But a, a lot of people are, again, you know, especially who are critics of, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, as we should be, because yeah. look, look, under his administration, there's been a lot of corruption, yeah, like, lack of oversight. What we have, again, let's right, go over right. with Emanuel, the issues that we have with Emanuel. Well, he's gentrifying the entire city. He's kicking people out, out that he's shutting down schools. He's not doing anything about the corruption. He's not doing anything against the police brutality. I mean, I, and, he, I, and he's using the TIF funds. He's using TIF funds. Fund. He's using TIF funds as slush funds. He's pushing the Obama mm-hmm. library when there's really good 
people saying shouldn't he's gonna he's planning to spend two hundred million dollars. There's a whole list. Like if I had a scroll, I could just drop down and it would start rolling on the floor of the issues. Mm-hmm. Right. And plus, I'm, and plus, there's lead in Chicago water. Yeah. Like seventy percent of our city has lead in its water. So you know, there's you know, it's, it, it, we're a major metropolitan city, and we got that. So um, the thing is, though. A couple of people are, are concerned that one, if this hyperloop is uh, built, it's going to take away jobs from taxi cab so, drivers, Uber, and Lyft. And two, uh, people are wondering if a lot of groups are wondering if, uh, well, because you know he, uh, he's building this hyperloop, it's taxpayer money going to be used for it. So I think it's very important. Then, we, we we definitely bring yeah. that up to light. And so the other thing is that they're also they also want something like, hey, are you going to be? Is this going to be tax exempt? Is this not going to be tax exempt? Mm-hmm. It, how much? He said, they've, he said that there's going to be union labor building it. How much union labor is going to be building it? What are the workers going to be paid? There's a lot of questions that I, you know, at first when I first heard the the, the backlash, I was kind of skeptical. Then I listened to a number of people. I'm like. They're fair points. Yeah, and, and they are and, fair and points actually, to bring up, especially with Chicago's and history. And, and actually, because we didn't have time to do it now, I'm actually I'm going to write out a letter to the boring company, see if they respond to us. If they do, we'll talk about it next week. If they don't, uh, we won't. But so what? I, how, how I see right now, there's really three aspects that people, like Kit mentioned, are worried about. That you have, you know, granted they are private companies, taxi, Uber, and Lyft. Uh, you'll have you have a lot of drivers that will lose out on driving in O'Hare. But I want to say just from, because I do drive for Lyft, it's I I don't always make more money. I don't actually go to airports because it's just a mess, just be, literally because of all the traffic. So one thing I think that would benefit from this is if you take away twenty thousand cars going or however many going back and forth via taxis or Ubers, you're going to reduce congestion on the Kennedy, which is just synonymous with bumper to bumper traffic. So. That's one thing that can happen. It would also be more energy efficient than to do it with cars. So you're actually helping the environment out. So, but that's the first issue is that the people that would drive to O'Hare wouldn't be able to drive to O'Hare, or not as many people. It wouldn't have the same capacity. Not as many people would need it. Of course, if you're not going to downtown, because there's many other people that are going to the suburbs or somewhere else in the city, mm-hmm. this wouldn't really affect it as much. But it's an issue. It's, it's an issue that people that are driving for the the, the sharing the ride sharing economy just you wouldn't have as many people. True. Um, and again, the issue then is people are saying he's saying it'll cost about a billion dollars. I was saying earlier how Elon Musk would be if there is a person who could build it for a billion dollars. It seems like it would be him if there was one person on the planet that could do it. Right. Um, and from his point of view, he's been very hard trying. His goal, as far as I understand it, is to crisscross the country with hyperloop like technology which actually funnily enough would act, would uh take out the or take out a lot of the domestic airline industry because you'd have a cheaper alternative to a plane that you didn't have to be strip searched to get on which makes w- it ironic that it's going to O'Hare right and yeah. so in this case you have him <laughs> trying to say I'm going to shoulder the burn because I see it from his point of view Chicago this is like a I'm just doing this to test so that I can my big plan can work, and I'm yeah. on a show, and that way business people can go, oh wow, this hyperloop, why don't we have these everywhere? Yeah, and that's and, what he. I think that's what he wants to get out of it. So, yeah. from his point of view, he's saying I'm going to privately fund it again. We're going to be watching that. His his history is that he really is of major corporations. He takes a very very small amount of uh, uh, money, if any, from his ventures from public dollars. Like I know with the the uh, Gigafactory, I think. Um, Half a percent of the construction cost was subsidized by Nevada. So, I mean, he, we're, we're dealing with companies that are like, oh, well, I'll just do it with 20% taxpayer money. So I'm like, eh, it's much better than the alternative. And then they have a solar or battery venture in Australia. Yeah, and that and the, they're saving so much money in Australia because they didn't have to build all these new coal power plants that they would have had to otherwise. So I like I, on one hand, I completely understand what people are worried about because we live in the city of Chicago and in ev- – Basically, every other venture this has happened, we just shell out taxpayer money. It's like, oh, take yeah. the money. just You can have it. It's and, free. And, and Your Chicago, business. And look, Chicago has a long, sad history of corruption. Look, the reason why we cover Chicago is not broke a lot is because you know no one really talks about the fact that the, the this tip is where from, This is know, where the money usually goes. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is, like all like the communities are taxed, and then that money goes to the TIF funds, and then the TIF fund is basically used – by the mayor and this administration to help out his, uh, you know, donors as well as the rich elite and help build up the downtown area and more affluent areas of the city of Chicago. And a lot of people are, rightfully so, uh, angry and upset and, and critical. The and and, and the thing is, if if Elon Musk and the Boring Company is going to get TIF money, then yeah, we'll call them out yeah. on it. That is 
because the thing is, what's happening here in the city of Chicago, what's happening to the low uh, income working class communities, the black and brown communities, what's happening to them is wrong and unjust. You know, you got Inglewood being gentrified. You got Pilsen being gentrified. The Northwest Side housing uh, area being uh, gentrified. You even have it happening in South Austin. It's happening all over the city of Chicago. And so when we hear about this hyperloop, especially how it's just going to downtown, uh, Again, people are like, oh, this is Chicago business as usual. Yeah, and so I think that there's one way to look at this that I don't think a lot of people have in terms of a long stretch. Let's assume that just for a second that all this works out well and that it isn't – just, just to have an argument that it will. Because I think one next step might be, well, why wouldn't we connect a Hyperloop to Naperville? Why wouldn't we connect a Hyperloop? And if we do that and we take – because to get to Naperville, Chicago is like an hour drive. If yeah. you could shave that down to like 20 minutes – you would be much, you can live in Naperville and then do a day commute in Chicago. And mm-hmm. if you could do that, then people could actually spread out more. And if they did that, gentrification would actually be a much smaller issue because, in, because in a sense, even though everyone's far apart with the suburbs, you still bring them together. So you could live in a suburb yeah, but, that's far out but west but the, but and still is, be in but, the city. But the thing is that Elon Musk has to deal with, especially in regards to something like that, is that, you know, the fossil fuel industry, the car industry, or the automotive industry, as well as all these old businesses that have been around are trying to do the best they can to really stop any kind of new innovation and green technology. And I want to point out that Europe has actually, they didn't do it with the Hyperloop. They did it with high-speed rail. But they don't have a, a, much of the issues that we have with public transit, long-distance public transit, don't exist in Europe because they have a really well-developed Long distance public transit. Same thing system. in China, Japan, and South Korea. When I was a kid in 1998, I went to uh, Japan uh, to visit some family, and uh, you know their transportation was awesome. light, was yeah. was light years ahead of us. Yeah. And they and during that time, you know, it's a lot of time has passed since 1998. They updated their mm-hmm. infrastructure, so whatever bullet trains they had back then go much faster now. And so, but that's the point that the U.S. right now the counter is that now everything has to be done by cars, which increases carbon emission, which increases traffic, which it's just a waste in people's lives sitting in traffic. And, and Chicago and, has a lot of traffic, and so that, if you and could, that helps out the fossil fuel industry and the automotive industry, Paul. I, I wanted to address this real quick too: the the argument that if this um, hyperloop goes in connecting O'Hare to the downtown area, that will disrupt. And what's the figure on that? How many people make that trek every 20, day? Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand. That's a huge number of people, and they're saying, okay, well, that could affect. You know, transportation industry, taxis, Uber, Lyft, even buses and trains. Like, what are we going to do with all the jobs? And I just want to be like, guys, people have been seeing the writing on the walls for the transportation industry for years. We've got automatic, uh, um, automated cars coming right around the corner. We're going to have automated trucks. Trucking industry is going to have issues. This is this is the wave of the future. This is how we need to start thinking about transportation, particularly en masse, Mm -hmm. in large cities across the country. This is I didn't ever, I didn't ever, never thought of that. That's actually a really good point. We're already going to be automating vehicles anyway. Why not I mean in one sense then you look at it and say, well then it's about how much carbon footprint do you need to make to make someone move from x to y? And hyperloops uh, in uh, can be run on solar panels. Well, yeah. trying to protect legacy industries is a recipe for failure. Yeah, it always is. And and, and see that's neoliberalism at its core. And another thing we have to take into account, I think, well, a lot of people are, are are really concerned about is jobs because right now people are struggling. The reason mm-hmm. why Uber and Lyft are where they're at right now is because look, people are doing that aside because you need to work two or three jobs. Uh, just to make ends meet. And what I think a lot of people want to know is when this Hyperloop is being built, uh, will will it be union contracted out? Well, I mean, ho- is there how, com- how many people is, is are going to maintain it? Is there community benefits? Yeah, like, just yeah. like what they're asking with the Obama library. Should, should, what, what is the benefit to the community? And that's something that I think uh, the Boring Company, if you're listening, uh, Elon we're, we're Musk, if you're listening, you yeah, we're going to send you an email. We know you're listening yeah, to Elon. So, so, so we'd like to have you on the show and really talk to you about this and the benefits that can be done to the community because the people of Chicago are struggling. And I understand that a lot of people who live in this city, uh, you know, it's it it's a struggle to live in the city because we, we, you know, the rents are going up, owning a house is going up, and it just seems like like a lot of people are just used to just being screwed over, and so that's why it's important for us to really see what the benefits are for this hyperloop. Now, in regards to Elon Musk being a multi billionaire, which is what he is, mm-hmm. um, you know, he's invest, you know, he's definitely done a lot in regards to innovation and. Uh, you know, electronic cars, uh, green energy, and space, space. travel. Yes, and, Carb- and, and eventually, and, I like to say, eventually, carbon neutral space travel. Yes, yeah. and, 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 so. And, and and so the thing is, is that should we have a government that should be already investing into that programs, like how the European Union is doing, how Saudi Arabia is doing, right. how Russia and China, how they're doing that too? 
The answer is yes. We should have a strong NASA should, space program. Yeah, we ideally, have, this should already yeah, have yeah. been in place. Yes, this all should have been in place. Yeah, we and don't have and, that. But we yeah. don't have that, and it's really unfortunate that, sh- that it's a, a multi-billionaire that's doing it by himself. And the thing is, Elon Musk, and correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, has gone on record saying that NASA should have a stronger space program. Yeah, they should no, get he, more he, funding. His original idea with starting SpaceX was to give NASA some more funding. Yeah, and, oh. and so... Uh, I'm pretty sure if he was here, he'd say, like, yeah, NASA should have more funding. NASA should be leading the charge, but it, that's not the case. And in order for us to have a government that's going to uh, invest in green energy or support, like, uh, cars that are electronic and have a strong space program, it's going to require us as citizens to step up and get involved, get politically active, and remove the old guard neoliberal corporate establishment system that is in place so that we can have elected officials that can then invest – wisely taxpayer money into green energy, renewable uh, resources, uh, better vehicles, and, and, so and again, the, a strong space and program. Then a, a, and then a publicly owned system like he's developing. Yeah, like, uh, like, said, like a better infrastructure like, program. Like I said, right, right you know. now, really it is going to be people that are mainly business travelers that are going to come to Chicago for a O'Hare, and then they're going to be able to skip it. Granted, the, the line, again, is private, which is why we don't want to have any public money in it, and we're going to call it out if it does. But... You know, it, it, the, it is. He's testing out. He's trying to prove for the world. Hey, this thing works. You should adopt it. It's Here's an concept. example. And look, if the United yeah. States doesn't adopt it, I can guarantee you this: uh, because Australia has yeah. that large power plant there, they they might consider adopting yeah. it. The European Union I mean, might consider exa- adopting it. Is, China, everyone else might consider exa- adopting it. As far as I'm concerned, it's, he's using the same strategy he did when he in, he um, got Australia that huge uh, gigawatt battery pack that they're all ecstatic about now that it's. Um, because it's like everyone's power bills have gone down because of the peak demand issue that they were having. Mm-hmm. So is this is this something that once it's built is going to be a fantastic thing for regular people in the city? No, it's not. It's Is it something that that they've said right now that taxpayers are going to pay for? No. Has the city lied about almost every business deal? Yes. Yeah. So we're going to watch it develop, but – if it happens the way that historically Elon Musk projects have, I think that we'll be okay. But we are in Chicago. And so. just selfishly, and I want to ride on a Hyperloop. Of, <laughs> yeah, well, I, well, that okay. goes without saying. Okay, yes, yes. I would well, like to well, definitely... Well, that'll be... Well, we do, if we can do that, we'll definitely film that. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely yeah. covering the Hyperloop. Getting to O'Hare in 12 minutes. Look, I got to see that with my own two eyes because... Going to O'Hare, look, I got family. Probably won't that see I, much of anything. You'll be in a tunnel, but y- yes. still, <laughs> no, I, I know that. But the thing is, I have family that flies into Chicago, and being one of the few people in my family here in the city that has a car, driving to O'Hare is a nightmare. Oh, and yeah. everyone who's listening, I don't even care what political spectrum you're on, whether you're Republican, Independent, Democrat, young or old, we all know driving to O'Hare is a nightmare. Okay, and I just had mm-hmm. to say it in that voice, driving to O'Hare is a nightmare. And I want to throw in one thing that really has, as a detail <laughs> I thought was interesting, it has nothing to do with the important conversation we're having, but it's re- related, is that they were talking about that maybe they can get the Hyperloop to be a, a pre-check so you can get your baggage checked at the Chicago terminal and then just get on your plane. Oh, wow. That'd, That'd be, be pretty neat. cool. That'd be nice. Yeah. That, that would be awesome. I mean, well, I, think about handling luggage now. Like, if you're taking the blue line, you, you know, it's oh, better man. than driving, but if you're taking the blue <laughs> line into O'Hare and you've got a lot of luggage, you've got issues. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no. Uh, definitely. Oh, my God. I, I remember one time uh, before we even started Harlan's Meet, I went to visit some family members in New York, and I actually had to take the blue line to O'Hare. Mm. Yeah, don't don't do it. Don't. Please don't do it. No, that's how I do it. No, but in, in reality, what what would be an ideal world is that the city already would have been working on this, and it would have been a you know city city funded with now. with the revenue coming back to the taxpayers. I mean, but you know, Cor- Chicago is too corrupt for that at the moment. We have too much of a feudal system. But we're going to see how this goes. We're going to keep following this. If this is going to be a big story for the city. It looks like it's. For all intents and purposes, it's going to happen. Yeah, the mm-hmm. manual seems to, to be uh, drooling that this is going to be happening. So yeah, and, and, and it's going to be a question of how. And if the one thing is, uh, if I know Mayor Emanuel, he, he definitely wants to have some form of political win over New York or all the other cities, saying like, yeah. "Look, I have the Hyperloop before New York City yeah. has it, before yeah. LA." And he's doing it during else. an election yeah. year, which yeah, we which, shouldn't forget. Yeah, so that's that could definitely give him some. It's points. like, oh, this, I to, I'm going to get elected. I have to get reelected later this year. Well, we're going to upgrade all the L trains, and we're going to build this mm-hmm. and we're going to help the children and it's going to be fantastic but there's a way we can stop that remember last saturday we covered the fact that pat quinn is g- getting a petition out there to be on the november 6th ballot so that term we can limits. put term yeah. limits in the office of mayor so not once if but twice we can actually vote mayor manual out so remember get involved and vote 
uh, and participate in November 6, 2018, so that you know you could hopefully that signature gets you know that that petition gets signed and is put on the ballot, and uh, then 2019, there's there's a whole bunch of mayoral candidates that are out there. Uh, now's the time to really look at who who you want to be our mayor. If you're upset at this current mayor, now's the time to step up and get involved. And final note, um, we're gonna follow through with this story. If the boring company takes TIF or t- uh, Chicago taxpayer money, we're gonna call them out. And we're gonna investigate. So to the boring company. Uh, to Elon Musk, if you're listening, if somehow you hear about the show, we invite you guys to be on our show. We'll send you an even email. a representative. Yeah, we'd be e- happy e- to talk with yeah, you guys. Even a representative, we'd be happy to have you on the show so we can answer these questions because a lot of people in this city are concerned. And if you look into Chicago's history in regards to corruption, um, you can you can, a, you can understand why why why, why, why a lot of people are upset yeah. and concerned. So that being said, Paul, I want to give a uh, yep. end the story over to you. All right. As we often do, I take it from the hyper-local to the very international. I just wanted to comment on this because we've been talking about it for the last few weeks. Uh, We finally got the Trump-North Korea summit uh, in Singapore, and the prevailing wisdom of it seems to have been we don't really like uh, the agreement that we've gotten out of this. It's vague. It doesn't have anything that, you know, verifies that that North Korea is denuclearizing. We've given North Korea what they wanted. We've pre-capitulated and given them this world stage already. Um, That's been sort of uh, what most people have been saying about it, and I kind of look at it in a different way. We don't have a full and finalized agreement. This is not like the Iran nuclear deal. It's not finalized. It's not signed. There's nothing that's on paper that's super, you know, final and set in stone. Instead, we sort of have a pre-agreement with really an international summit that went off without a hitch, right? Mm-hmm. There was a photo op. There was some shaking of hands. There were some awkward moments. There was Trump saluting the general from North Korea, which he's not supposed to do, which people are trying to make a big deal out of, but it's not really a big deal. Nobody cares. And ultimately, we've got North Korea making a very reasonable request, stop flying nuclear-armed planes over our country like you've been doing for the last 50 years, and we've got a reasonable request. Hey, put a halt to your nuclear program. And that was agreed upon. Yeah. Um, we need to have more things set in stone, but this is the beginning of a d- diplomatic process. So the criticism that we've given Kim Jong-un what he wants, legitimacy on the we world stage. We can never redeploy our army or navy ever again. Oh, no. Yeah, th- this, this hand-wringing over this is such a, a loss geopolitically, I think, is, is misguided. Any step towards peace is a good t- step in my opinion yeah um look i have family that lives in japan and when this whole crisis was happening between trump and kim jong-un you know with these war of words you know the fact that both countries have you know nuclear weaponry uh we if if there was to be a war you know no one's going to walk away from that unscathed and i I can't think of the countless millions of lives that would be lost this is a potential for peace and we'll see if this is a success or not i hope it's a success i want it to be a success i don't want war on the korean peninsula and I don't want millions of people to lose their lives. Now, look, Kim Jong Un is a dictator. You got to call him out for what he is. And Donald Trump and his and President Trump and his administration, uh, look, they're doing a lot of stupid, crazy, horrible things too. But the very fact that there is some groundwork for some potential peace, and maybe somewhere down the road, not in our lifetime, that both Koreas can reunify, and then finally have a, a country that's ending uh, a, a separation that was going on for countless years. You know, there, there is a potential for peace, and I'm glad that we're down that road. But at the end of the day, we have to, you know, hold all parties accountable, and it's up to the people to really push forward for peace. Now, Paul, I'll give you the yeah, final word. I really want to point out that this is, uh, this is a big win for peace, but it's also a really big win for the president of South Korea, who really was the one who was able to force these talks to take place. Because if you remember just a few weeks ago, you've got – John Bolton adamantly making sure that the Trump administration does not get involved here and trying to get Trump administration to pull out of the agreement. But when you've still got Kim Jong-un sitting down with uh, the leader of South Korea and actually moving peace talks forward, you put the Trump administration in a situation where if they want to get a win out of this, they've got to go. Yeah, and, and, and I'm glad you said that because then we have to move on to our mm-hmm. uh, guests very shortly. Um, the very fact that both leaders, including Kim Jong-un, were adamant uh, to have this peace talk with or without the United States. I think this is the first time ever we're seeing a a dictator basically tell the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, uh, hey, we're going to have this peace talk with or without you. And the president of the United States came, yep. like bent to that pressure yep. because this is a, a historic moment. Now, I want there to be peace and I want there to be a better future. And I'm hoping that this leads to that road and that eventually – 
uh, the two Koreas will reunite after you know, 50, 60 plus years of being separated. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I hope that, that this just keeps going forward and that nobody screws it up and that, um, you know, everyone at the table follows through. I don't like the, the Trump yeah, administration yeah. as much as anyone else, but yeah. I got to call a win a win. Yeah, and it, and it is a win. It's a historic win, and it's the first time ever we've seen in our lifetime. Hopefully, and you know, as a final yeah, note, just yeah. to put on there, and like you said earlier, uh, this is uh, pa Pakistan and India are even saying, hey, right. this is a great example. We want to follow this. This could be this. a template for, yeah. for peace talks between those two countries, yeah. which are both nuclear powers. Yeah, so uh, here's hoping for a better future. So... Um, there is a path to peace, and let's just let's just follow down that path because the path to war will lead to the destruction of countless millions of lives. So, on a better note, uh, we are going to uh, speak to members of the 12th IPO. Now, we had a representative from the uh, 25th IPO on our show, and it's very important that uh, we actually talk to these groups because they're covering issues that uh, you know a, corporate media usually ignores, such as uh, you know. Most Keep, things. Yeah, yeah, most things, such as infrastructure, keeping public schools open, and also having to make sure there's a clean environment, affordable housing uh, for the people living in said communities. So with that being said, we have two representatives of the 12th Ward IPO here on our show. For our viewers and listeners, can you please introduce yourself? We'll start with you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Kit, and uh, you guys, you know, I really appreciate uh, what you guys are doing and you know, standing up to, to the corporate media. It's, uh, it's amazing to hear what you guys got going on. I really appreciate it. My name is uh, Esau Chavez. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, with uh, a member here with the 12th Ward IPO, and uh, you know, super excited to uh, be here. We're um, been working on a lot of things for uh, for a few years, mm -hmm. and um, you know, wanted you know a lot of things going on. You guys mentioned the uh, uh, mayoral race uh, is always uh, you know, extremely excited. Want to make sure that you know there's a uh, you know I, I think the be best case scenario sometimes would be that uh, hopefully maybe. Ram doesn't even make a runoff, you know, but that would that's, that'd be something. That would be, wouldn't that be something? <laughs> and uh, I think uh, um, we we have a you know we have a lot of good stuff going on, and uh, you know really got to just keep keep it going, and uh, you know get you know make sure we're we're making the most for our for our community for our communities, and I think that's what it's uh, that's what it's really all about, you know, realm. Make sure that there's a you know getting to the you know peace and, and Korea stuff and all that, you know, it's really you know, want to make sure you know no yeah. more fighting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you? And hello, my name is Miriam Ive Perez Lozano, and I rep I'm a member to the 12th Ward IPO, I'm a treasurer at the moment. Um, I represent Brandon Park in the 12th Ward. Okay, so uh, I know that uh, a lot of people, you know, perhaps maybe they, they might not remember our first interview with the 25th IPO, but what, what is a IPO, and how did you guys get started, and what led to your creation uh, for, for the 12th IPO? Um, so the 12th Ward IPO kind of started... I joined in 2016. Mm -hmm. At this point, I know it was coming to um, to president elections, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's kind of where it started with Bill. Bill Drew was one of our founders with um, Bill William Drew, his son, mm -hmm. and uh, we were kind of there. Were where I start? I joined for the when they had a presidential forum in Brighton Park. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted when I when I first started voting. The the way I wanted to vote was the way that my mom and my dad had always voted, and that was just like you know pick the persons that m last name sounds most Mexican to you, and so you know I, when I when I I did made a, I made a mistake I voted for you know Rahm Emanuel and I was like okay I need to start being more knowledgeable about my vote and the twelfth word IPO had an event in Brighton Park in a place that in my neighborhood I thought was abandoned, and that you know I could walk right over there and they had a a presidential forum and you know we heard from representatives from a couple a couple candidates mm -hmm. and afterwards we made a decision if we should endorse them and after that it just kind of we went around the neighborhood and we started working with our friends knocking at doors like vote like talking about these candidates kind of acknowledging them and I think that's something that is an opportunity for a lot of people to know about who they're voting for providing the for the platform for mm -hmm. for for you know for a, a way to educate yourself. I don't know, Issa, would you like to? Uh, yeah, definitely. I th you know, I um, uh, think uh, when the, one of the first things that uh, I remember was um, uh, a candidate forum that, uh, that Bill Drew, uh, the 12th Ward IPO definitely mm -hmm. would uh, is, uh, have, has, is a, it's the, really the, the creation of a, of Bill drew a lot of uh, a lot of work that um, he, he carried a lot in the neighborhood, 
and um, we've uh, continued it. And um, we really, um, through his uh, different forms of uh, reaching the community, mm-hmm. uh, whether it was uh, helping out somebody from the neighborhood or um, f- uh, f- creating these forums for different things uh, for the schools, he was involved in the local school council, mm-hmm. and uh, really uniting that force and uh, being able to uh, to uh, make a difference. I think uh, there's been uh, some uh, you know differences we've been able to make. And, uh, right, and, and and so recently though, the twelve IPO has uh, really been fighting against uh, this asphalt plant mm-hmm, that's going mm-hmm. to be built near McKinley Park, as well as there's talk about privatization or mm-hmm. building some privatization areas on McKinley Park. So uh, in the past, Harlan's Media did cover that story, but we know that the twelve IPO was definitely leading the charge against the asphalt plant. So first, uh, one. Who is le- uh, who's, what's the company behind this asphalt plant that's going to be built uh, near McKinley Park? And two, who is the alderman representing this area, and what is his stance uh, on this asphalt plant that's being built there? The the current ownership is Matt Asphalt. Mm-hmm. It's a the, it's interesting the relationship there with uh, the, the 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 property the owners there is Matt, Matt Leasing. There's a couple of things going on there, and. Um, it's uh they've uh the elderman is uh, George Cardenas and the way it kind of went down was it you know it w- was no community input this is something that the community clearly does not want and uh we, we want to make sure that we are doing the you know what we need to do to uh but really if we can shut it down that would be the you know our that's our that's our goal really um we want to make sure that that they stop um, doing all that, you know, stuff. It's gonna, it's gonna make the. There's proven, there's proven um, cases where uh, it's changed the uh, the effects of like this. There's definitely a smell uh, within a certain distance. The park is right there, and I uh, want to make sure that you know, we're really uh, folk creating you know sustainable areas in uh, in, in the communities, and uh, we really don't want to hurt 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 our uh, you know see our community hurt anymore. It's a uh, you know. It's, a, it's these are the things that are you know continually attacking us and uh, so we're going to continue to uh, hold them accountable we have uh, some things planned for later in the in the summer mm-hmm. and uh, we want to you guys are more than welcome to uh, to be there as well yeah. send us an email yeah, send us an email <laughs> reach out to us we'll yeah. definitely be there so uh, I want to get your input on the um, asphalt plant that's being built there and especially in regards to the alderman that uh, is he act is he listening to the constituents and concerns? Well, this is something that kind of started um, uh, a committee within the 12th Ward Appeal, Neighbors for Environmental Justice, and these are people that are very dedicated to just have more community input. I live in Brennan Park, where this, where we have more um, people coming out and voicing that they don't want this as well play is in McKinley Park. And I live in Brennan Park, and Alderman Cardenas, you, he doesn't, to have community input like I've I lived in the neighborhood since 1998 and there has been youth dying on the streets and I don't understand why is it from 8th grade to 12th grade that this is still happening where is he having these conversations with the neighbor with the community that how can we fix this because he's and to go and talk about the asphalt plant he had no community like, in, like he didn't invite anybody to talk about this we have a park we don't have that many parks on the southwest side and he he's doing this and a lot of folks are, are upset about it. He's also I, the chairman to the environmental um, committee. Really? Yes, he is. And oh, that's, this, that's good to know. Yeah, and this is why we're also concerned, because if he's the chairperson, why is he not more educating us instead of doing things without our input? Mm-hmm. So I want to ask a question that kind of takes a few steps back from this. I mean, on, on one level, the news isn't covering this because it's not a sexy story. It's not doesn't have Trump in the name of it. It's It's... To do this kind of work, you know, we've talked to a lot of people, and I always am interested to hear what people's answers are to this. What drives you to do this? This is hard work that, for most people, is equivalent to just grinding your head against a wall until it bleeds, and then maybe you uh, you get a victory. What drives you to be part of this fight, and where do you see the 12th IPO growing into? Can I start? Oh, um, so... Some me and Isa, we both talked about one of our founders, Bill Drew. He he passed away um, a year ago, and it and a lot of he he brought us into this. He at least brought me into this, and just the way he would talk, he would say, "Go deep and go broad." When he first said that, I was like, "Okay, you know, it's just go 
go deep as in like we need to share interest with the people that we organize with and to go broad is that these people have relationships where they're going to help us like you these relationships take take us somewhere and i know that when you go deep you're actually finding out like these there's people oppressed in our neighborhood that are traumatized to even come out um you know, we're and and i say that's why because we live in a community that's majority latino and and if not now when and if not us then who so mm-hmm. you know it's it's a matter of we're we're losing lives we've lost enough already we have nothing more to lose we need to again if not us then who if not if not when then you know yeah exactly and i agree it's 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 up to the people really to step up i've always been saying on the show daniel's always been saying on the show like if, if we don't step up and fight for a better future there's no one else around that corner so i know that also your organization has a good working relationship with the mckinley park progressive group is, is that correct and i know that uh, you guys are definitely helping on regards to the unfortunate um policy that ice is implementing on especially immigrant families so can you at least explain uh what what's what's going on with that uh here uh between 12 ipo and mckinney park progressives let's, let's start with you i think i think uh, we, there's been a, a a lot of different um you know just the, the attacks by uh ice uh, been really increased uh and uh, it, we've uh want to make sure we're standing up against that in, uh, in in several ways, and uh, one we're gonna we're gonna continue to uh, to build. I, I, um, I I'm I'm not I'm not partic- I'm, I'm not um part- I know w- one thing that one of our local community members um, did, who's part of the alliance as well. Uh, he's actually raising some money for uh, a, a Salvadoran family who came in, mm-hmm. um, the, the Flores family, and um, they uh, they. Uh, are, are refugees and they uh, from 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 El Salvador, and they, they are currently raising some funny on GoFundMe. If, mm-hmm. um, if if people are interested in uh, in helping out, what what's the GoFundMe page? It's um I I don't have it. I if we if when we'll I, send send us to us for when we do the uh, the video, we'll have it in the link. We'll have it in the link, and so then mm-hmm. our viewers and subscribers definitely. can definitely contribute and help out because it's it's quite clear that what's happening to the immigrant families, uh, especially near the border, the fact they're being separated and being put, and the children being put in uh, kennels. For dogs, it's it's disgusting and barbaric. Now, Paul, I know you had uh, a question. Yeah. I just wanted to know if you wanted to, to give any additional information about an event you have coming up next month. Actually, is, uh, July fourteenth is your platform convention. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, can you give us a little bit of detail? Uh, we'll start with you about the next event that we're having. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the next event that we're holding is going to be on July 9th and this is um, with the Committee of Neighbors for Environmental Justice. We're going to hear. Um, how because we don't want the asphalt plant we want to shut it down right and so. and, and i think uh, you know daniel you definitely have a history of being a lead contractor and the dangerous poisons uh that come with lead and, uh, and countless other things but with asphalt i mean there's it, it's quite clear there's some chemicals and yeah. some Again, residue that can my, make effect in the my that, expertise that can is in yeah. uh, heavy metals but uh anytime you have a system where you have on mass like concrete or asphalt uh, creation you're going to get volatile chemicals that are not normal for we didn't evolve to be like oh let's just take an asphalt all the time so it's not good to have that in your system i'm sure you have similar effects to like tar i don't know off the top of my head what effects there be but it's yeah. a, it's asphalt production it's an industrial plant yeah. well, it's not and in a country that doesn't care about environmental laws it's not going to be good yeah it's, and, it's, and it's also important to note that especially here in the city of chicago you know we, we've definitely talked about gentrification and uh, you know, development uh, coming into a lot of uh, low-income working-class communities. Now, um, it was an asphalt plant. I, I don't know if there's going to be a lot of... Uh, uh, oh, they're, we, I'm sure we, they're going to get a lot of condos put in? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm pretty sure yeah. that's not going to happen. But there is uh, there was definitely talk about, um, and it was definitely kind of used by the Chicago Tribune or Chicago Sun-Times in regards to um, privatization of certain parts of McKinley Park and other areas, especially in Brighton Park. Can you let our uh, viewers and listeners know just uh, what is happening uh, with with that kind of development, yes, definitely. Um, I think um, one thing that uh, that was they wanted they wanted to really do up, upcoming was they wanted to put some apartments in there, and uh, there was a little there's a little bit of a community backlash. Uh, things kind of slowed down. It seemed like, and you know, the asphalt all of a sudden uh, uh, came in again, or there's somehow I don't know some it worked out. I don't know you know it, how this is how how it's managed to get here. I know there's a. There's uh, some more stuff that's uh, that we're you know we're still working on making sure that uh, everything is uh, 
you know, is working because this is clearly some sort of, you know, it, it's going to change the community in, 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 a, in a way. There's people talking about actually uh, leaving the, the community. That, that, that's, that's, been, that's been said that uh, they might, uh, if, if, they really, if they really feel the, the, the effects of it, that, 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 then, you know, that's not one thing that we uh, really want to promote. Um, and uh, so in this, in that area particularly, I know one one of the previous uh, we actually had had a uh, a forum before uh, discussion about uh, what could be done in the pre- in the in the manufacturing district right right there the um, uh, the, P- the plant manufacturing district and uh, you know there's uh, several ideas of you know maybe like a, a food incubator or, you know get you know get some uh, lo- local uh, local things going in there for yeah, like like a local uh, garden and yeah. uh, maybe a community center so right. people can go yeah, to which, which which is something mm-hmm. uh, the city of chicago especially in a lot of low income communities don't have and mm-hmm. it's it's really devastating to know that we have this happening to our city and uh, you know, when I look at the asphalt plant, I'm just there's two things going on in the back of my mind now. Now, now that we're actually really talking about it, one, uh, it's it is an industrial facility like you guys have talked about, like Daniel has talked about. Uh, but as soon as it's there, you mentioning people wanting to move away as soon as it, 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 if it's going to affect them. Once the people move out, then you have a large. Uh, th- then you can see that plant being shut down. You have the large real estate developers move in. They buy the properties. They kick out the remaining population. They gentrify it, and then what remains of Brighton, what remains of the original community, what remains of the community by McKinley Park is long gone. And it's another sad history of and gentrification. It's just much easier to kick. It's much easier to put everything in. We've been talking earlier in the show how. There's a master plan for the city. Yeah, to turn it to a, to a, to a second Silicon Valley, yeah. bring in people that have more money, redevelop areas for that population. Right. We were talking earlier about the um, the Hyperloop and how that fits in that plan. And um, it's uh, what do you guys think of the the way the, the city's going? I think I, I think I have an idea what your answer is, but why do, why do you think the city has decided that there is really no place for people that? You know, in a sense, aren't don't make a lot of money. I, cause they they take away our right. I mm-hmm. I feel that we Alderman Cardenas doesn't have community input with us because he knows that most of us can't vote. You know, the only time we see them coming out is when it's electoral. But you know, the twelfth IPO is political and electoral. We educate people, regardless if you can or cannot vote. That's what we do for election day. Um, I was um, an area coordinator, and we taught I train people to be other def- other positions in uh, on election day even people that are undocumented and they were excited because undocumented people also want other people to vote and we want to encourage them and we can and we just tell people the only way you can participate on election day is by voting mm-hmm. that's a lie you can do different other things on election day and you don't need to be documented to help out and the 12th ward does that and we just want more community input and the, and we want that from Alderman Cardenas. Alderman Cardenas, if you're listening, please, you know, we need a community center in Brighton Park. Right. And the development needs to be taken into ownership of the people, undocumented or documented. What, what and I want also add, to the Alderman, if you are listening, you're come on the show. We want to talk to you as well. What I want to know is uh, how long has the Alderman been in office for? Hmm. Uh, has he been in uh, for a long time, like 10 years? Because, like, I mean, Chicago, with, just in case you're listening uh, and you don't live in the city of Chicago, we've had aldermen and Cook County commissioners that have been in office for 30-plus years. So I'm curious about this current I mean, How long has he been in office for? It's, uh, I think it's over over 10 years. I think it's over, over something. Since over. Uh, May 2003. May 2003, <laughs> he's been in office. Oh, wow. It's uh, good to know that uh, we have such a keen-eyed... Uh, you know, guardian. What a, what a, what a new person that yes. has some bright and fresh ideas yes. coming up on so, 15 years in office. So, uh, so what I want to ask then, I think what a lot of our viewers want to know is 2019 is going to be a very important year. It's going to be a municipal election. What are you guys doing right now to set up a ground game in regards to potentially having a new uh, you know, alderman? Are you guys uh, reaching out to people who might be potential challengers to the current alderman? Are you looking at Cook County commissioners? Like, what's uh, what is the 12 IPO's uh, game plan in regards to uh, being a strong presence, especially for 2019? Um, right now, I, I think it's uh, we're uh, really um, kind of uh, uh, making sure we're organized as a community. Uh, Want to be you, when uh, I think uh, when the you know if if, if when, you know when the moment comes, uh, I think uh, we'll be uh, we'll be very active and uh, we'll be excited for uh, for the 2019 election. I think we do plan to make a, a difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, regardless, and uh, uh, you know we're going to be uh, we're going to be uh, going to be ready to go. I think uh, we've uh, 
this past election, we were able to do uh, some uh, help out a, a, a good, uh, good, uh, good friend of ours, uh, got, um, winner of the, the Democratic primary, mm-hmm. uh, El Manaya, win the uh, the twelfth ward mm-hmm. uh, outright, maybe except for uh, a ward uh, precinct. But uh, you know, they were, and they were, uh, so it was. Uh, uh, we're, we're we're serious, you know. We're, we really want to uh, want to let let folks know that uh, you know, getting back to uh, you know, the, you know what, what's going on, how 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 a lot of this uh, it, it really looks. It, it a lot of it really does look uh, uh, racial racial. You know, there's a lot of um, you know uh, people of color. You know, whether it's uh, uh, African American, uh, undocumented people. Uh, you know, and that's all across the board. Um, it's uh you know it's pushing it's p- pushing people who have been historically coming into Chicago to uh, better better themselves you know we're, uh, we're you know people who have been uh, uh, making Chicago really what it is uh, time you know generation after generation and uh, you know we keep it seems like we keep doing the same thing almost and uh, you know it's getting it's getting worse it seems it's getting worse and we you know we're uh, really want to make sure that we uh, we're, we're we're continuing the uh, you know the legacies. That, uh, that 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 we that we've uh, that, that you know, precede us and um, as you know a lot of uh, um, you know history want to make sure that we we don't we don't forget uh, I think um, you know one of the things uh, that uh, that we, we've like tossed around is is you know bringing uh, some sort of like hi- historical society even to to Brain Park while uh, you know while we're uh, you know what you know because you know it, it's sometimes it's it, it, you know it's, it, we got to make sure that, that we're you know right now while we have you know each other that uh, we're uh, we're getting involved and um, really uh, gr- growing and making a difference. Okay. Yeah, um, we're gonna continue to pressure Alderman Cardenas to support us in the asphalt plant and to support our community concerns. If if he doesn't pay attention, then the twelfth ward is considering candidates to run. It's something that we talk about, and we need to. Continue, we continue to organize. We we want to keep the relationships that we made in this last election, and we're gonna go. We're gonna be in the forefront. That's uh, where. That's where. We, it, it's quite clear. You guys definitely have a strong presence, especially for uh, helping out Oma Anya, who's also endorsed by Our Revolution Illinois. So, and I know that she took the seat that was previously held by Cook County Commissioner uh, Jesus Tui Garcia. That's correct. Yes. Correct. Mm-hmm. All right. So. Um, you guys had some. No, oh, no, you're doing good, man. Okay, all right. I, don't know, I thought I thought you saw somebody over there trying to ask a question. So, um, I think uh, as we're nearing the um, end of our second hour, end of our show, I think uh, a lot of our viewers definitely want to know more about the 12th Ward IPO, and uh, if if there's anyone who lives in, especially if they live uh, in a 12th Ward and they're listening to our show, they might want to. If they never heard about you guys, maybe they want to contribute and get involved. Where can they find you guys online and on social media? Um, we ha- we have a Facebook page at the mm-hmm. moment, 12th Ward IPO, mm-hmm. and we had a website, but it's not up yet, so I would suggest to just follow us on Facebook. That's where you can find us. You can find our, um, also our committee is on there, the Neighbors for Environmental Justice, mm-hmm. and we have, a, our email is 12th Ward IPO dot org, yeah. Okay, well that's a, that, that, oh, hold on, you had something else you want to add? Oh no! We'll, we'll, we'll definitely we'll, again with the, we'll get you all the links at, at the end. Of okay. It. And uh, but we're, you could definitely find us on Facebook, and uh, you know um, th- that's pretty much our, our primary one. You could pretty pretty reliable. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, definitely in regards to fighting for a better future, and as well as holding our elected officials accountable, I wish you guys in 12 Ward IPO all the best, and definitely let's uh, um, not have that asphalt plant because. Look, we, we've been in East Chicago, Indiana. We've seen firsthand what happens when you have these industrial uh, factories and facilities near community. Um, and the way this uh, city is set up, I really doubt there's going to be a strong regulations or environmental protections on an asphalt plant. Um, that being said, I want to thank both of you guys for being on our show. And to our viewing audience, uh, if you... We also want to point out that we're, uh, again, we're broadcasting from the Q4 radio studio. You can find them at q4.org. And uh, you can, obviously, if you're listening to this, you know the station, AM 1680. Yeah, and Thank you guys, definitely. You know, guys, I really appreciate you you guys having us on. Thank you. No, thank you guys. And keep on fighting a good fight. And if you like what we do... Uh, check out our website, hardlensmedia.com. We also have a Patreon page. Uh, you know, your support is the main heart and backbone to everything that we do here. Uh, let's build a strong, independent media outlet here in the city of Chicago, and let's all do what we can to build a better future. Peace, everyone.